um, also for me, it took me a while to understand because the first time I heard Peterson, it's like, what is this guy talking about? Like yeah. Marxist plus Mar <laughs> how is this all connected? And yeah. then, because it is, it is complicated the way it's connected. But one of the things that was more elucidating for me of the connection with it is when this guy that will put the, the, the same doctor that I was talking with, with Peterson a couple of, of weeks ago about the importance of fathers, he said he was a feminist and when he would go to feminist conferences, there would be two types of books, feminist books and Marxist books. That's it. Oh, interesting. So he would really see the connection, like they were taking all these ideas from Marxism and plasming them instead of change, saying bourgeoisie and proletarian would be men, women. Mm. So with this, with very, with the same concepts. Mm -hmm. And I used mm -hmm. to also call myself a feminist because the, what I was indoctrinated with when I took my gender, like psychology of women class was feminism means equality for men and women. It's like, of course, I'm up for it. But that was the definition of the first wave and I believe the second wave of feminism. But then it just changed. It just changed and it was not, it, it was not equality of men and women anymore. It was just kind of women are superior and better and deserve more. Like women, they were trying, yeah. they were pushing more to women deserve all the rights and not the responsibilities are, responsibilities are just optional. Mm. Which, which again ties with politics, which again sounds like a really beautiful sentiment, but where are you going to take, where, from where are you going to take this money for all these rights that women have? From taxes or from people, let's say. So it's it's not such black and white but mm -hmm. i would say humanist yeah i'm more of a humanist <laughs> yeah the, and because yeah. what's also happening along with um like you said this great ideal of like men and women are equal that's a beautiful aspiration um and also requires a bit of investigation as to what that means mm -hmm. like does that mean equality of opportunity does that mean that like physical equality that we want to make women look the same as men like we have to identify first what equality is exactly um, and i think yeah that's a complex issue as we talk about gender um and what is going on in canada is pretty interesting you know, this uh, proliferation of the idea, kind of a diminishment of the importance of gender, even mm -hmm. legally, right? Because um, Canada being a really progressive country, um, I know that there's a bit of early education in, in, uh, in schools about like basically teaching kids that they can teach, they, they can choose their own gender. And then there was also, so they could identify as male, they could identify as female, they could identify as like a her, even if they were born with a, a penis um, and vice versa. And then there's also all of the legal, uh, the legal aspect of yep. this bill that passed that's I think approved like 71 pronouns that people can pick and choose from. Yeah, or they can make their own. Yeah. Yeah, and this is the first time like we connected, I think, when we started talking about Peterson on our own private conversations of the, yeah, this gender theory and how gender theory is not based in science and it's based, it's from the 60s and they're kind of saying how there's an infinite amount of genders. I think when people mm -hmm. started talking about it in the 60s, they had no idea people were going to say infinite. Maybe they're going to be three or four or five. But now there's mm -hmm. a the amount of genders. And which again, which is I think we were, we were talking on our private conversation. If people want to believe they're whatever they are and they are adults, then it's fine. In the same way, if people want to get wasted or they want to have... Um, um, they want to have multiple partners. They want to do all of those things when they're adults. Then go do you. It's fine. But the problem is when they start interfering with other people's rights and when they make them into the law. That's when it becomes dangerous. 
Mm. So, and do you feel that that's what's happened? People are well, over, people's rights are being overstepped and it's become yeah, the law. And, and I think, and that's one of the reasons Peterson became uh, so famous because he's super, he's very smart, very eloquent. He knows he has a lot to offer. But the thing that really struck a chord is when he did that video about Bill C-16. Mm -hmm. uh, related, in relation to Bill C-16 is what you were saying about in some, some places in Canada, I know in Ontario is the case, it, as part of the curriculum, they have to teach children that gender is not a thing, that you make up your own gender, which is just what I mean. They're overstepping in people, other people's rights. It's like, wait a minute, I don't want my kid to be thinking that my kid can be just on a wimp, can be intersex or transgender or identify as uh, older. Because, you know, some people start to identify. There's this case of this guy who's in his 50s with six kids who now identifies as a six-year-old woman or a six-year-old girl. Which is a In Canada? In the U.S., in the U.S. Which is this, as I believe it's in the U.S. So it's, just, and there's some people who start identifying as cats. And foxes. And, and fairies. Foxes and fairies, mm -hmm. which just creates a lot of confusion because it's this thing of like, nothing is right. You make your own reality, which if you are an adult, you want to do that. You're in your, your 25, 30, your prefrontal cortex seems to be developed. Go <laughs> do that. Yeah. Yes. Don't go and indoctrinate our children. Right. Because that is such an impressionable age, even a vulnerable age to be disseminating. Um, yeah, we have to be really careful about what kind of information we're giving kids. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. like they don't need to know these things. I mean, the trans, the transsexual community people who people who have the um gender dysmorphia uh last time i checked it was about 0.02 percent of the population oh wow it's very 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 small which is the schizophrenia is more prevalent we don't go and tell kids about schizophrenia when they're like seven years old schizophrenia they also need to know what's clinical depression Right. Like, where do you fall on this spectrum? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It seems like a pretty advanced thing to be talking to a child about. And also crazy to be giving kids authority on something so huge. Right. There's like a place for parents. There's a place for uh, deferential authority when you're a kid because you're like you said your prefrontal cortex isn't fully formed and and they the kids need to be parented mm -hmm. yeah, yeah exactly so I think one of the one of the things that I've struck me like it hurts me every time I hear it it's when parents like parents of my friends when my friends were little, tell them like, oh, I don't want to impose any religion on you or any belief in anything. You will choose mm -hmm. that when you're 18. Mm -hmm. they, they seem not to realize the importance of believing in something when mm -hmm. they're younger and giving them a structure and tell them, telling them from the beginning the importance of believing in something, like kind of yeah. telling them there is an afterlife. Pray mm -hmm. to God, pray to these things. When, so giving them something and then when they grow up, 18, and they don't want to belong to that religion or spiritual tradition, then it's up to them. But leaving them empty from the beginning, thinking mm -hmm. that they're doing a service to the kid, I just find it really sad. Mm. Did your parents impose like a religion or anything on you? They imposed Catholic, yeah, they imposed a religion on me being Catholic, um, which... It come, I guess it's more related to authoritarian or parenthood, which I think authoritarian parenthood, in my, through my bias, it's better than permissive parenthood. Mm. So we have authoritarian means high control, low mm -hmm. forms of affection. Mm -hmm. and on the, the complete negative opposite, it's neglectful parents, which is low love, low control. Because mm. like they, use it, they don't even care what their kids are. I think I've seen our culture moving from authoritarian 
to permissive, which permissive is low control, high love, which is that type of mm. thing. It's like, oh, choose your own religion, choose your own yeah. thing. You don't want to say hi to adults. You don't want to eat your vegetables. Don't eat them. <laughs> <laughs> which like Bill Mayer calls like the screw you mom generation. Like screw yeah. you mom. And it's yeah. funny because I, like you're the product of a more authoritarian uh, parenting style. I'm the product of a more permissive parenting style. Um, like especially my parents divorced around like age 11. And from that point, it was like high amounts of love. Like we love you, we love you, we love you. And I, I always felt that and, and no guidance, mm. no guidance. And I remember being so desperate for meaning without even knowing that's what it was. Like I, I took myself to church because I was like, I just want to know like what is going on. And like, I wanted some sense of who I was and even culturally, like it's not like my parents identify strongly with a cultural group either. Um, and, and I felt, very lost and made choices that I thought were based in freedom and at the time felt like really rebellious and really good but looking back were not made of informed consent you know it wasn't because I truly wanted what I was doing it was because I just didn't know any better mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so interesting so interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The way our, the way that our parents decide consciously or unconsciously to parent us, and how that results in different, different situations, different mm -hmm. problems, and different great things, different gifts. Yeah. And coming back to this issue of gender, which is how we kind of got on this. Yeah, um, the permissive parent would be like, "Oh, do." We won't, kill, we won't give you a gender because that's oppressive and it's patriarchal yeah. and it's yeah. cisgender, which I don't like that word, by the way. Cisgender comes, comes from gender theory. Then you, we will let you choose your own gender. So the kid is like, the heck? Mm. Like, I am, I'm less smart than a puppy, right? Like the baby. <laughs> so how am I going to choose all of these things? Oh, you right. don't want broccoli? Don't have broccoli. Right. And um, just, to, just to bring back to like, just to give the other perspective of parenting. So what research shows is authoritative. It's the way to go, which is high, high control and high um, expressions of love. Is that what research shows? Yeah. Authorit so you I have mean, authoritarian, permissive, neglectful, all the way there, which we don't even talk about. And then authoritative, yeah. it's the one who has high both. And depending okay. on the maturity of the child, you start to make the rules with the kid. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there's both. There's not such a thing as like, you're not going to the party because I say so. That's authoritarian. Authoritarian, Authoritative yeah. is like, okay, I maybe as a parent, you're 15. I don't really feel comfortable with you going to a party. These are my, this is my reasons why. Let's come to a mutual agreement that is beneficial. I, as a parent, I still have the, the last say, but I'm here to listen to you and maybe we can work something together. So that's mm. authoritative. And you can start mm -hmm. very young. Mm. Maturity of the child. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, we have just a few minutes left. And when you were saying, when you said like, I don't like this word cisgender um, because it's related to gender studies. So I know that that's your opinion, that's your point of view now, but I also know that you are coming from an academic background. You just finished your master's in spiritual psychology. You're an immigrant in a very liberal country. And I know that um, you, as you said yourself, you're really indoctrinated in that whole academic world of gender studies and feminism and um, oppressor oppressed dynamics let's say uh -huh. so 
so what was your journey like from that place identifying with that to to now like Um, what happened in the interim it was never i think for me it was more the way i was raised catholic i was raised catholic and i was like oh these things i say people are telling me to believe in these things i'm gonna believe them i'm young i don't know much so when people are starting to talk about oppression in, in university, oppression, the patriarchy, like the pay gap and all of those things, I was like, hmm, that sounds interesting. Mm-hmm. Some of them were like, wow, this is horrible. How come women were not allowed to run marathons until the end of the 80s? To me, it was just like, what? It's like, why are women not allowed to? It's like, yeah, because they will lose their uterus. It's like, that's in the 80s. That's like so, I don't know if you knew that, but yeah, women were not allowed to run marathon. That's crazy. That's US. so crazy. Yeah. So some of those things may, sounded true. Some of them didn't sound true, but I ate them up because I thought it was actual. Re- it, I thought the gender studies were actually based on research because that's what they would say, but it was not really based on research. A lot of it is based on opinion pieces. Mm. So in what people feel and what women feel like. So the term that I, they've been using in the circles is red pill. So I think I was red pilled the way people who become really SJWs when they. And and that's what's an SJW. Yeah. When people become social justice warriors and they start to believe all these exaggerated things of oppression, they have a term that says some people got, got woke. Mm. When people start to getting out of those things, and seeing more wait so so being being woke is when you recognize the oppression yeah woke is like the opposite yeah. of being red pilled so those are like these concepts that they're being circulating nowadays okay so woke is like i am seeing the pay gap and i'm a feminist and and there's so infinite I'm, I'm amount woke. of genders yeah infinite and there's amount infinite amount of gender so i'm really liberal and i'm really progressive yeah and and who am I to say that a burqa is oppressive? That that's been woke. Right. Okay. And then the new what people are calling the new punks are the people who the, the transformation is called being red pilled, like in the matrix. Yeah. That they start to see the nuance. And it's like, wait a minute, the pay gap it's not as simplistic as people used to tell me. Mm-hmm. Or wait a minute, the oppression of of, uh, Mexicans, Black Americans, it's not as also black and white as I used to to see. So those people are, say, say being red pilled. They're giving like a a, uh, more of an openness openness into reality. And I think a key a key word in that definition is nuance. Mm -hmm. It's like looking at the nuance. It's not so binary. It's not so black and white. It's not so simple. It's yeah. quite nuanced and deserves to be recognized with the sophistication that it, it really holds. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Like, I, yeah, the same thing, even being with against, like, against the 1% or mm-hmm. the one, against the 2%. In the States, if you make, if the co- combined income of a family household Allegedly is if you if the household makes more than a hundred and ninety thousand dollars per year, that's you're part of the two percent, which is not that much. That doesn't make you a millionaire, it doesn't make you a billionaire yeah. either. And then Bernie Sanders and people that are more, more liberal saying like, oh the two percent and the one percent, like they are the the people who are killing America or the United States. It's like those are very small companies. Yeah, like America, they're also, you know, like, so again, it's like the new ones. Um, yeah, so and why do you think why do you think people are so adverse to looking at the nuance to, di- to dissecting and looking at nuance? I think why is it not happening? I think it's heuristics. I really believe it's heuristics. I, I don't mean, know what heuristics are. It will be like it's karma, right, and spirituality. But then oh. it's heuristic. Heuristics is if I tell you right now. Um, I went to eat, I went to eat spaghetti at a restaurant the other day. So you'll be like, hmm, maybe you would think something like you sat at a table on a chair. There was a waiter. They give you spaghetti and that was likely to be an Italian restaurant. 
and more often than not, you will be right. Else if I tell you an African-American, you will think of a black person, even though that person could be from South Africa and it's white. Mm. So heuristics work most of the time. That's why they're so useful. So heuristics is like a generalization? A generalization that our mind uses so to, to work. To more simplify. To simplify. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because, yeah, because our brains are built to simplify like the tons of information that are thrown at us moment by moment. And as we progress as human beings from babies, which we see more things as black or white, black and white, black and white. And although, and again, as we're adolescents, we start to see a little bit of nuance, but again, we still see things black and white. A lot of people stay in that stage and they want really simple answers. Rich people bad, poor people good. Mm-hmm. Um, anything like I don't know. White male or males are aggressive and sexually deviant and yeah, something like that. Exactly heuristics. Mm-hmm. It's like mm-hmm. so we with we use a lot of heuristics which are very useful, but they stop being useful when they're not useful which is when we start generalizing and, and um, I think that's one of the reasons why people are so enamored with ideologies, like with Marxism, which is a very simple ideology, is the rich people are bad, poor people are good, give the money from the rich people to the poor people and everybody will be happy. Mm. It's like, wait a minute. It's not that simple, but it's attractive because it's, it's a simple idea. Oh, there's, there's a lot that's attractive about ideology. Um, I was telling you before, like Peterson's expression that ideology will often give premature and unsolicited authority to whoever is holding that, that ideology. Like they know. Like when you believe something, oh, yeah. like you, you know, uh-huh. and you are morally superior. And that doesn't matter if you're a Republican or a Democrat or a, a radical right, radical left, if you're a yeah. feminist, if you're a, a Nazi, like you always have this moral stance of like, I am right. And I think dissecting that and making room for nuance, which is also making room for humility. Yeah, exactly. So much yeah. humility. Like there's a lot that I don't know here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's so interesting ideologies. Like Jordanson describes them as crippled religions. So he says that they are like a crippled person will get you, will walk, but it will walk, won't really walk really well and it will be painful to walk, but it will get you somewhere. Mm-hmm. Like your legs will get you somewhere. Because an ideology, one of the main definitions, it's, it's smaller than a worldview. It's a way to look at the world with simple ideas and you put that lens into everything. But it's not as comprehensive as a worldview or as comprehensive as a way of living. It's Mm. much more simpler. Mm -hmm. And I think what, what, what our embodied spirituality is asking of us right now is to go beyond ideology or at least see the vista that's possible outside of ideology yeah and as you said humble right being humble to wait a minute maybe i'm not right i'm not seeing all of the elephant i'm just seeing one part of the elephant Mm -hmm. yeah and that's probably a good a good place to end i just wanted to say one more thing yeah go um so I was listening to Jordan Peterson talks about uh, Harry Potter quite a bit. And I don't know if you remember the second book, The Chamber of Secrets. I think it's The Chamber of Secrets, right? Uh, well, there's I just past- watched the movies. I didn't read okay. the books. Very similar. It was my favorite book. And he says how you have Howard's. Howard's is this epitome of this book wonderful beautiful piece of architecture that i as a kid would have loved to go there it's like wow like this is majestic so this is like our our potential 
or our the goodness inside of us. But then underneath there is a basilisk, which is this monster that it's so terrifying that if you if the monster sees you or you see the monster, you get petrified and you may die. And which is and that repre- lives underneath Hogwarts? Underneath Hogwarts. And that is a representation mm-hmm. of the shadow, of the shadow self, the the on on re- on the non-claimed part inside of our psyche. Mm-hmm. And that Vasilisk has, uh, has a price, and that price is Ginny. So usually the Vasilisk has a virgin or a treasure. Virgin, a virgin being the representation of something which is pure and beautiful, and like a piece, okay. of, like a piece of non-dual experience or a, a higher piece of truth. So that's Ginny. Okay, so there's, there's Hogwarts. Beneath Hogwarts is like the unclaimed self. There's yeah. this scary monster that creates fear yeah. and petrifies everyone. And then the monster has some... A treasure. Uh, a treasure that it holds. Yeah. Which, okay. funny enough, ends up being Harry Potter's wife, Ginny. Ah. Even though it's crazy because J.K. Rowling wasn't sure she wanted to pair Harry Potter with Ginny. She wanted to pair him with Hermione. But for some reason, it's like, no, I'm going to be a rebel. I'm going to pair him with Ginny, which even gives me even more meaning to this analogy, which is mm. in order to go through that, in order, the monster was keeping that virgin and that beautiful piece of truth. Did he, of kid, did he kidnap Ginny? Yeah. He did. Not the monster, but like Voldemort, but like okay. they were both there. And in order to access the shadow, which also holds a, a deeply profound, beautiful truth, you cannot just walk into the shadow. In order to walk into the shadow, you had to go to the worst possible part inside of you that you don't even want to look at. Which in the case of Harry Potter, it's the toilets, but not just any toilets. The abandoned toilets that no one goes to, and there's this ghost, Myrtle, who is this whiny, unlikable ghost that cries all the time. So in order for the, for the self, to go to the shadow and get the treasure has to go through the worst possible thing place you want to look at, which is the uh, hidden toilets in order to access the underground in order to go and meet the monster. Mm -hmm. Which I found fascinating. Why? Because, um, which is very, it's many levels to it, but also in the level of mindfulness, in order for us to really be there with what is and having more access, the way I understand it, more access to a non-dual experience, is not to just by being with what is happy, being with what is joyful, being with what is easy, which is be just like walking around Howard's in this beautiful place. But it's actually looking at the places within our psyche that we least want to see mm. through the toilet and then through being staying with the toilet, staying with the misery, staying with the suffering, then we have access to the monster within us. So the toilet becomes even more horrible, becomes this monster. Mm -hmm. And then by staying with that in a compassionate and loving way, then we have this gift, this gift of openness, this gift of a possible non-dual experience of being, Mm -hmm. of really finding who we truly are. And interesting that that, in the context of Harry Potter, that that genie became his wife, this kind of, you could see that as symbolic of wholeness, you know, yeah. coming to meet your, your better half or your life partner or the other part of yourself that is pure and true, virginal. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Beautiful. So... It was amazing how J.K. Rowling was able to make all these kids read like all these really big 600 plus pages. All these yeah. kids reading them. It was amazing. They're like, yeah. oh, they're just funny, but so silly books. It's like there was a lot of truth in them. Yeah, which but, is probably why they were so impactful yeah. and successful. Mm-hmm. Well, Marco, it was so good chatting with you today. I feel like we touched on some really good points and got to dissect some some nuance together so thank you for being here thanks for your time 
yeah thank you so much for that it was great finding more truth together and spending some time and yeah some very interesting things came up and i think we got closer closer to truth <laughs> then stay tuned because cool. we'll we'll talk about hawkins on our next dialogue yes next one okay bye everyone okay. bye marco love you blair bye love you Hello my dear friends, thank you so much for watching this video, we really hope you enjoyed it. If you have any questions or comments, please let us know in the comment section below. And make sure to like this video, share it if you think anyone can benefit from it, and subscribe to our channel if you haven't. So we can keep you updated on more awesome videos on yoga, mindfulness, spirituality, psychology, etc. Thank you so much.